Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, it is true we've known each other for a long time. Mark was my first PhD student, and yet I stayed in the profession. Um, um, it's not too late yet. Now, it's great to be here with, with uh, a number of old friends um, and uh, to s see so many um, new faces. It's actually the, the first time I've gotten to speak um, to the English department here. I've been here uh, a number of conferences that Mark has run, where, of course, we would we're generally speaking somewhere else, and um, I was here as part of a review team, but this is great to be here as a guest of the department. Um, it's also great to be part of the series that you're running, um, uh, uh, celebrating soldiers at war. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be talking about um, veterans connected with U.S. wars, um, but I am going to be talking about the aftermath um, to one of the most important battles um, in European history. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the battle itself, um, but instead about uh, the kind of responses to the battle, or the aftermath, the kind of public response to Waterloo in England. Um, but this is, of course, this year is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. June 18th um, was the uh, 200th anniversary. There was a massive reenactment um, on the battlefield um, in June. The, the actual reenactments were on the 16th and 17th. 120,000 people showed up to watch about six or seven thousand reenactors put on the battle scenes, um, and uh, it was basically attended by the leaders of most of Europe. Though oddly enough, not France, who um, refused to send anyone representative after the Belgian government issued a special version of the euro commemorating the defeat of Napoleon, <laughs> and uh, they didn't really think that this was, you know, really very friendly. So the, the French boycotted. But um, um, but you know, it's it, it, again, the, you know, this incredible moment in European history, of course. That everyone had thought uh, the Napoleonic Wars were over in 1814 when Napoleon had abdicated and essentially retired um, to the island of Elba. But of course, about a year later in the spring of 1815, he escapes, returns to France, where immediately the French say, thank God Napoleon is back, um, raises a huge army and is marching on, um, on, on Belgium. Uh, the Allies rapidly put together a counter-military force under the command of the Duke of Wellington, so the British were in command, but key forces um, under uh, Blücher, the, the, the German forces, along with uh, Belgian forces. Um, to this day, it's kind of difficult to understand exactly how Napoleon managed to lose the battle. Uh, he didn't lose very many, and uh, he had all sorts of advantages. Um, but if you go to the to the the battle site, and I, I was there this past summer, you do, one of the things you can see is that you know if you if you've ever looked at plans of the battle, it says there's a farmhouse here and a farmhouse here and a farmhouse here that basically anchored the British lines. What they what they don't necessarily point out is these were basically fortified farms. There were huge uh, stone walls around these farms, and the British were behind these walls. And the French repeatedly tried to turn their flank by attacking one of these farms, and um, there was just massive casualties. Uh, Wellington in particular, but Napoleon as well, were known for um, uh, achieving victories by sacrificing large numbers of troops. Um, a minimum of 50,000 men died at Waterloo. Um, there are estimates that if you count the entire several days campaign around Waterloo, that there were 120,000 people who died. So this was a, um, a massive um, set of casualties. Um, Napoleon surrenders by the end of the day, um, puts his, himself in the hands of the British who he thought would treat him better. They ship him off on a warship, the Bellerophon, where he sits off the coast of England for a while uh, so everybody can go wave at him, um, and then um, they <coughs> exile him to St. Helena. So a little bit about what I'm not talking about, the actual battle, uh, but now we'll, we'll see what happens uh, in England afterwards. Wellington issued his official report on the Battle of Waterloo on June 19th, 1815. It arrived in London on the 21st of June and was published as a London Gazette Extraordinary on the 22nd. Benjamin Robert Hayden, the painter and friend to Keats, heard the news from a messenger for the Foreign Office on the night of the 21st as he was leaving the house of John Scott, the editor of the weekly newspaper The Champion, to whom he returned to celebrate the news. Hayden wrote in his diary on the 25th of the impact of the Gazette on himself and another editor friend. This is Hayden. Read the Gazette again. 
I know it now actually by heart, dined with Lee Hunt. I give myself credit for not worrying him to death at the news. He was quiet for some time, but knowing it must come by and by, so putting on an air of indifference, terrible battle this, Hayden. A glorious one, Hunt. Oh, certainly, to it we went. This anecdote suggests some of the division within the response of the British intelligentsia to the news of Napoleon's defeat. On the one hand, Wordsworth and Southey danced around a bonfire in Skiddaw, singing God Save the King and eating the standard British roast beef and plum pudding. On the other hand, William Hazlitt, who viewed Napoleon's loss as the utter extinction of human liberty from the earth, was extremely distraught, with Thomas Noon Talford finding him staggering under the blow of Waterloo as if he had sustained a personal wrong. And again, with a painter Hayden describing him as prostrated in mind and body. He walked about unwashed, unshaved, hardly sober by day, and always intoxicated by night, literally without exaggeration for weeks. The public response was, of course, celebratory, if rather muted. The Times for June 22nd indicated that preparations are being made in all parts for a great display of illumination to take place tomorrow evening in consequence of the glorious victory gained over the whole of the French army. By June 26th, the Times was calling for a national day of thanksgiving to Almighty God, a fund for Waterloo widows and orphans, and a triumphal arch to be made up of cannons seized at Waterloo and surmounted by an equestrian statue of Wellington as the great conqueror uh, to be put up at the entrance to Hyde Park. So already a few days later, on June 29th, there was a meeting of the merchants, bankers, and traders of the City of London at the City of London Tavern to propose such a relief fund. The day of Thanksgiving would, of course, eventually occur, occur, but not until January 18th, 1816. And it would be 1846 before a statue of Wellington was placed on an arch, not made of cannons, and not in Hyde's Park, but at, at Green's Park. And by that time, the statue would raise a controversy. What is perhaps surprising is that the Allies' decisive victory at Waterloo did not prompt the kind of celebrations in London that followed Napoleon's abdication in 1814. Then, elaborate festivals, including fireworks, didn't they? greeted the arrival of various European leaders. Green, St. James, and Hyde Parks were all given over to fair-like activities, military reenactments, and fireworks. And huge parties were thrown, including a masquerade ball held in Wellington's honor at Burlington House on July 1st by Waitier's Club, of which Byron was a member. Those earlier celebrations were perhaps still too fresh in the public's mind to be repeated, or more likely, the incredible death toll of Waterloo made such entertainments seem frivolous. Still, there were many sermons preached on Waterloo, and particularly its widows and orphans. There were many poems published within a year of the battle, at least 32, according to Simon Bainbridge, and perhaps 100 or so if we include periodical publications. And there were several Waterloo museums established including the Waterloo Exhibition, featuring the emperor's clothes, superb dresses from the emperor's apartment, and miscellaneous gleanings from the battlefield, the Waterloo Rooms, which displayed Napoleon's chargers stuffed, and a display opened by Mr. Palmer at Pall Mall, the advertisements for which focus on the fact that good fires are kept. There's also a panorama of the battle at Leicester Square, and at Bullock's Museum, an exhi exhibition of Napoleon's war carriage, that uh, would inspire both Byron's carriage for his travels in Europe and a broadside, the coach that Knapp ran from, an epic poem in 12 books. One of the big disgraces of the battle was Napoleon had, had abandoned his war carriage to flee the battlegrounds and, of course, abandoned his troops. It's notable that the most frequent appearance of the word Waterloo in the Times during the months following the battle is in advertisements for packet boats taking tourists to Brussels and the battlefield. The theater that key public event did in some small ways acknowledge the battle. On July 3rd, Astley's Royal Amphitheater was announcing a new song entitled Waterloo or Bonaparte Defeated. And on July 4th, Drury Lane, one of the two main theaters in London, added to its evening of plays an address spoken by Mrs. Edwin in honor of the immortal Wellington. On July 6th, the King's Theater, that's the Opera House, presented an evening of martial music in celebration of the victory and to raise funds for the widows and orphans. And Sadler's Wells announced for July 5th a new song by Charles Dibden called Wall Waterloo or Wellington Forever and offered on August 14th the Bellerophon or Nappy Napped. 
Again, on October 23rd, the same theater featured a song performed by Mrs. Charles Dibden called The Wonder of 1815, which apparently celebrated the various wonders of the year, including in the order of this advertisement, the fire-eating lady, presumably Madame Giradelli, who among other tricks spat out melted lead marked by her teeth, the Dutch dwarf, Simon Papp, who was seen by some 20,000 people during the year, the Irish giant, an allusion to the famous Patrick O'Brien, but since he had died in 1806, presumably a reference to the so-called English giant, James Taller, who sometimes appeared with Papp, the Indian jugglers made famous in an essay by Hazlitt, then Waterloo and Wellington, followed by The Maid and the Magpie, a French play adapted successfully for three different London theaters that year, and finally, Wilson the Pedestrian, that is, George Wilson, a noted athlete who drew huge crowds to watch him try to walk 1,000 miles at Blackheath in 20 days, with 5,000 pounds being bet on his effort and with various attempts on the negative side to sabotage him. Here, in this song, Waterloo becomes just one more item in the sensational news of the day, not the central one. Beyond these songs, one finds only minor theatrical allusions to the years of war, as when a character refers to Napoleon's victory at Marengo in a completely forgotten play called Bobbin at the Bandit, staged at Covent Garden in early December. And there's a more direct account in an anonymous play entitled The Duke's Coat or The Night After Waterloo that was published but was blocked from performance by the government's licensor of plays. Apparently, this mere trifle, as the author terms it, derived from a French play, was censored because the author speculates, the licensor may think the Battle of Waterloo too grave and tragical a subject for an interlude. Whatever the case, no tragedies on the war and Waterloo were forthcoming, but the censor did not prevent the Christmas pantomimes from offering direct representations of the battlefield. Now, we might think of harlequinades, and since why would anything, anyone know anything about harlequinades? I'll tell you a couple things about harlequinades. So the most popular form of drama in the, early 19, in the early 19th century London were these plays put on at Christmas time, right after Christmas on Boxing Day. Um, the two main theaters would each put on rival uh, uh, harlequinades. Um, so these used Commedia dell'arte, so um, late medieval, early modern figures that originated in Italy and moved across Europe. Um, in stories that usually had a kind of frame narrative that would come from uh, sometimes from myth, sometimes from fairy tales. Um, we'll see from different sources uh, in, in this particular year. Um, and usually it involved two young lovers that are trying to get together. Um, they're being prevented from getting together by um, various uh, uh, negative figures. The, the lovers are backed by some good magical figure. Um, the, their opponents are backed by an evil magical figure. Um, as the crisis rises, the magical figures convert these characters into these archetypal uh, figures from Commedia dell'arte, from the Harlequinade. Um, most often they would be wearing large paper mache heads that would then be ripped off to reveal them in um, the costume of the, the, their, these, these kind of characters. So that would be, for example, Harlequin or Columbine, um, Clown, and so on. Um, there would then, so there's sometimes speaking and certainly songs during this first part, but there would then be a pantomime. There's no speaking as they'd run through a series of scenes, would have all sorts of physical humor in it, and this very elaborate trick work that we don't really understand. But for example, there's descriptions of scenes where Harlequin has a magic bat, hits a stage, uh, it hits a coach that is transformed into a balloon that rises off the stage. So there's these very elaborate things. In the next last scene, it looks like the bad guys are going to win, but right then the good, the good magical figure transforms everything and the lovers are reunited. Basically, the two major London theaters, these are the, the, these are the kind of core of the kind of culture industry in England. I mean, more people saw a play every night at these theaters than ever read Keats, for example, uh, during the period. Um, those theaters lost money each theatrical season if you took out the receipts from the Harlequinade. So these are, these are really the kind of core of the theater. Okay, so we might think of these Harlequinades, which often open with a story from a fairy tale or myth before moving to the tradi traditional panamimic struggle between Harlequin and his love Columbine and their opponents, including Pantaloon and Clown, as an odd site for reflections on Waterloo. But we find images such as the European pantomime, so a satirical image where Mr. Boney, as Harlequin, takes a flying leap from the rocky islet of Elba to the consternation of Louis XVIII as Pantaloon. Or we might recall Hazlitt 
right, of going to the Covent Garden pantomime that Christmas of 1815 to see the greatest of the pantomime clowns, Grimaldi, and this is Hazlitt. There was an ugly report that Mr. Grimaldi was dead. Here indeed he is, safe and sound, as, and as pleasant as ever. As without the gentleman at St. Helena, that is Napoleon, there is an end of politics in Europe. So without Grimaldi, there must be an end of pantomimes in this country. So when the Napoleonic Wars are not seen as tragedy, the events of the day are often found descending to political pantomime. So both Christmas pantomimes of 1815 opened as usual on Boxing Day as the afterpiece to Lillo's The London Merchant or George Barnwell. The Covent Garden Harlequinade, Harlequin and Fortunio, or The Treasures of China, offers an Orientalist tale with a frame for the Harlequinade proper taking place in China and the pantomime scenes being set in Brighton with the Regent's Oriental Royal Pavilion in London and then on the field of Waterloo. Harlequin and Columbine are supported by Xing Mu, the magical peaceful fairy, while their pantomime opponents are backed by Thun Tan, supposedly the Chinese god of war and thunder. These supernatural figures agree to put the characters through their pantomimic paces until on the plains of Waterloo, war shall join with peace to vex the world no more. The traditional penultimate dark scene, usually in a cave or other threatening locale ruled by the spirit backing the opponents of Harlequin and Columbine, is replaced by an extensive view of the plain of Waterloo as it appeared after the battle. Thuntan, the god of war, is contemplating its ravages and devastations when the peaceful fairy enters to bring Columbine and Harlequin together as the scene changes to the realms of peace. While the peaceful fairy recognizes the ravages of war, speaking of the bloody field whose blighted face wears desolation's withering trace, she also imagines that peace restores thy fertile plain, thy sunny meads, meads and golden grain. At its heart, the play is an argument for the necessity of war to create peace. Thun Tan makes the or Orwellian claim that Waterloo is where war gave general peace. The Drury Lane pantomime, the competitor, competitor piece, reflects the more somber view of the battle. Harlequin and Fancy, or the poet's last shilling, was created by Thomas John Dibden, whose brother had been including Waterloo and other contemporary references in his pieces at another theater, Sadler's Wells. The pantomime takes up many of the same wonders as his brother's song, with George Wilson appearing in a scene with a clown. Um, there's the clown as the Blackheath pedestrian. These are from toy theater sheets, so these were very popular plays. Afterwards, kids could buy sheets with the characters that you could cut out and backdrop so you could restage the play for yourself. So this is from a transformation scene where a peacock is transformed into the rival lover. Um, so there, there are some of these extant for these plays. So there's references to George Wilson with multiple references to the rage for those made magpie plays that appeared across London and with allusion to, if not an actual appearance by, the Dutch dwarf in English giant. The frame of this Harlequinade offers a kind of metatheatrical moment where a poet, contemplating his last shilling, desires to write a tragedy but realizes the unlikelihood of that project bringing him abundant recompense. His last shilling speaks to him in the language of the ghost of Hamlet's father, calling upon him to write a pantomime. The poet responds in kind through a parody of Hamlet. To write and what to write, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the bard to wield the bowl and dagger of the tragic muse, or to take arm against a host of critics and make a pantomime. Aided by fancy, who transforms, transforms the poet into Harlequin and opposed by satire, the poet does not so much write as become the Harlequinade. As in the competing piece at Covent Garden, Harlequin and fancy moves to Waterloo. It first takes us to a Waterloo museum with a theater borrowing helmets, sabers, and standards from the proprietor of the Waterloo Museum in Pall Mall, and then stages the triumph of the British lion over the eagle at the spot where Wellington and Blucher met to signal the end of the battle, with these soons thus alluding to the growing tourist trade around Waterloo, both in London and at the battlefield itself. Moreover, where the Covent Garden play celebrates war as the means for securing lasting peace, the Drury Lane Harlequinade insists upon the costs of war. We're shown Army and Navy pensioners, the survivors of the surviving casualties of war, and a Waterloo orphan, the object of all those sermons and fundraisers who dances a military hornpipe. 
Most strikingly, Dibden's Harlequinade represents one of the famous moments from the prior summer of 1814, which saw the kind of joyous celebrations absent after Waterloo. Dibden puts on stage the masquerade, to which I've already alluded, the Waitiers Club, chaired by Beau Brummel, hosted at Burlington House. So th this is just to give you a sense of what you have to work for when you're trying to figure out these plays. This is the print text. So Grand Interior Burlington House set it up for the fete given in this case, Emperor Alexander. All we're told, characters out of character, little men and great men. That's, that's it. That's the print text. That's all you know about that scene. This is the um, the, uh, the, the uh, manuscript that had to be submitted to the licensor of plays, it gives us a little bit more information, but not a whole lot. Okay, so this is this famous party from the summer of 1814. As many as 1,700 people attended that event, including Lady Carolyn Lamb, Byron's famous, uh, former lover, and Jane Austen's brother, Henry. While Byron's friend, John Cam Hobhouse, appeared in Byron's Albanian garb, Byron himself appeared as a monk. Though as one of the hosts, he did not wear a mask so he could be easily identified by the guests, unlike, say, the demi mondaine Harriet Wilson, who sought to keep her identity secret, not only by keeping her mask on, but by disguising her voice and speaking in French. As always, it's difficult to reconstruct the pantomime scenes Dibden puts on stage in recreating this masquerade, but we do know that it involved a giant and a dwarf, the giants referred to in the manuscript, the dwarfs referred to in a review of the play. So again, this could have been taller and pap. It's certainly a reference to them. As well as an ottoman that is transformed into a gondola that Harlequin and Columbine used to escape their pursuers. This is one of these famous pieces of trick work. We also know that the masqueraders engaged in a dance. And we know this in part because Byron and his friend Douglas Kinnaird, taking advantage of their positions as members of Drury Lane's governing committee, appeared on the stage, as Byron recalled. In the pantomime of 1815-1816, there was a representation of the masquerade of 1814 given by us youth of Waitier's Club to Wellington and Co. Douglas Kinnaird and one or two others with myself put on masks and went on the stage amongst the hoi polloi to see the effect of the theater from the stage. It is very grand. Douglas danced amongst the figurante too, and they were puzzled to find out who we were as being more than their number. It was odd enough that DK and I should have been both at the real masquerade and afterwards in the mimic one of the same on the stage of Drury Lane Theater. When the 1814 event reappears on stage in 1815, we see the period's interest in the circulation of ideas, images, and plots between life and stage, with a real event, a celebration of Wellington and the Allied monarchs, adopting through the masquerade the tactics of the theater, only to have the theater then reenact that event. Byron played the part of an unmasked monk at the masquerade, only later to play one of the masked partygoers during the performance at Drury Lane. This metatheatrical play with the real is per perhaps not surprising when we see a playwright capitalizing on other theatrical hits, such as those made magpie plays that it references, or upon celebrities of the moment, whether they be the English giant or Wilson the pedestrian. But Dibden also seems to want to draw attention to the difficulties in dramatizing monumental historical events such as Waterloo. While he and his counterpart at Covent Garden are willing to stage the battle at Waterloo, the battlefield at Waterloo, Dibden is careful to remind his audience that this is occurring in a theater in London, not in the theater of war. Harlequin and Columbine can dance across the field of Waterloo. Clown may perform his tricks amidst the ruins, but Dibden wants us to remember the tragic reality outside the theater, including the reality of wounded soldiers and widows and orphans. Acknowledging through his poet that he is not up to writing a tragedy on the war, Dibden uses the complex theatrical tool of the Harlequinade to ask the same question Wordsworth and Byron will. How can the creative arts treat the destructions of war? Wordsworth's Thanksgiving Ode volume of 1816 thinks through the difficulty of writing a beautiful poem about a bloody battle, of having imagination, as he puts it, stoop to the depiction of warfare. The volume returns almost obsessively to concerns about whether Wordsworth, the poet writing these poems, is the right poet for a poem on Waterloo. For example, the earliest written poem included in the collection is called Inscription for a National Monument in Commemoration of the Battle of Waterloo, which imagines the monument called for by the Times that was not built 
in order to write an inscription for it in which he proclaims the glory of death becoming death, which is dearer than life as the ultimate sacrifice made by the soldiers on the battlefield is justified because they quelled the impious crew. But then in the next poem, the sequence, occasioned by the same battle, February 1816, he wonders if there is a bard capable of writing such a poem, such as the one he just wrote, which must address both a glorious success and tremendous loss of life. Both this victory sublime and this hideous rout, a task the poem suggests better left to a chorus of blessed angels. Even as he writes poems of thanksgiving, Wordsworth wonders what sort of poet could give appropriate thanks for such horrifying sublimity. It is thus not surprising that the volume contains the sonnet Wordsworth wrote to Hayden, where he proclaims, high is our calling, friend, before worrying about how one can be both sensitive and heroically fashioned, how one can keep faith with the lonely muse while the whole world seems averse to desert, how one can continue to strive to create art when nature sinks. Here too belongs the poem to the Italian poet Filicaia, entitled February 1816, where Wordsworth admits writing poems on Waterloo longs to be like this predecessor poet from Italy, celebrating more simply King Sobieski's victory during the Siege of Vienna. The main ode itself has the poet, while writing a bardic response to the day of Thanksgiving, asking for a bard who to the murmurs of an earthly string of Britain's acts would sing. In taking up Wordsworth's ode, entitled The Morning of the Day, appointed for General Thanksgiving, January 18, 1816, we need to recall that Wordsworth did not write a poem on Waterloo, as did, say, Southey and Scott, but on the day of Thanksgiving. And thus the poem is less about the battle itself than how we should interpret its results, how we should read it. As the Times, London Times reported, January 18th had been appointed for general thanksgiving to divine providence for the reestablishment of peace in Europe with a particular form of prayer read in all the churches throughout the kingdom. This is actually from an 1851. So this was regularly the Church of England would, would set forth for major celebrations a, 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 a order of service that would be repeated in all uh, the Anglican churches in the kingdom. And there was one on this date, Jan January 18th, about Waterloo. In London in particular, a military ceremony, the depositing of the eagles, the standards, uh, Napoleon's standards, taken on the field of Waterloo in the Royal Chapel at Whitehall, was joined with a religious one. Here's the Times. The ceremony was conducted with perfect order and associated as it was with the duties of religious worship, the memory of the contest in which the trophies were won, and the sight of the brave veterans who survived its carnage. The influence it produced was not of an ordinary nature, but rather approached to a sentiment of sublimity. This service, as perhaps is true of all military thanksgivings, finds God in the role of God of battles, as the Times puts it who in the words of the prayer, has again overthrown wicked and rebellious people and restored to Europe peace, order, and security. The ceremony conflates God's will with the victory of the British nation. Wordsworth, too, will certainly link patriotism and providence in his poem, but he does so with a deep appreciation of the distance between the sublimity of God and the carnage that marks man's actions in this fallen world. Wordsworth ode ode ranges from the nature to uh, from, excuse me Wordsworth ode ranges from nature to God to an abstract account of the battle and the role of England the allies and France and then to a final giving of thanks appropriate to the day he celebrates the basic tropological move of the ode which establishes the gap between providence and politics or poetry for that matter is revealed in its first lines the poem, poem opens with a paean to the sun as a universal source of pure delight, universal and it shines on both the insensible and the rude, on both the haughty towers where monarchs dwell and the low threshold of the peasant's cell. In a move he uses throughout the poem, Wordsworth follows this hyperbole with the opposite figure of Lytotes. Not unrejoiced, I see thee climb the sky. This negation of a negation is found often in Wordsworth, if, you've, uh, if all of you have read Wordsworth before. But here it seems in particular to draw upon the etymological link of Lytotes to simple and its ethical link to humility. As opposed to the grandiose language of the description of the sun, the position of the poet, I see thee climb the sky, is offered in simple single syllable words. And he goes on to note that the sun's naked splendor dazzles the vision that presumes to gaze. 
The same pattern is repeated the close of this opening stanza, where we learn that the sun, with a splendor that dost warm Earth's universal mold, was not unadored by pious men of old. While these opening lines contrast the glory of nature with the littleness of man, the poem rapidly re reassigns the glory to nature's creator, God. The source of wonder is nobler than nature and lies far deeper than aught dependent on the fickle skies. This subordination of man's actions to divine providence sparks what may sound like an outraged response. Have we not conquered? Wordsworth's answer will be yes, but after a hyperbolic celebration of Britain that was able to rouse the wicked from their giddy dream of French liberty, Wordsworth makes his most striking turn to humility. The very humblest are too proud of heart, and one brief day is rightly set apart to him who lifteth up and layeth low. For that almighty God to whom we owe, say not that we have vanquished, but that we survive. Wordsworth worried to his friend Southey that this passage would be misunderstood, for he's asking his readers to set aside their nationalistic joy in victory for humility before God. We should be happy that through God's grace we simply for survive. We may be hyperbolic in our praise of God or even the abstract nation, but we as individuals must remain humble. This does not mean that Wordsworth is unwilling to celebrate the defeat of that soul of evil from hell let loose, Napoleon. How dreadful the dominion of the impure. To commemorate the victory, he contemplates a new temple along the Thames, much as others urged a monument to Wellington, perhaps as Edward Orme suggested, a replica of the Temple of Theseus in Athens. Wordsworth, while praising the simple ceremonies of thanksgiving held in some old minster's venerable pile and the humbler ceremonies that he and a few others will hold, also calls for regular commemorative services at Westminster Abbey. And if anyone doubt that God will approve of a martial service conducted in churches across the land, he reminds us readers that the God of peace and love is also the tremendous God of battles. He guides the pestilence, his, his draught consumes, and he puts the earthquake on her design. Yea, carnage is thy daughter. Well, this final phrase struck writers such as Hazlitt and Percy Shelley as a shocking celebration of violence as an act of love. I think that Wordsworth wishes to remind the thankful celebrants again that victory comes at a cost, that one cannot rejoice at the conclusion of war without remembering the violence that was the means to that end. We must recall, as he puts it, the desolated countries, towns on fire. In a closing litotes, Wordsworth hopes the day of thanksgiving, and presumably his poet on it, is an offering not unworthy. Throughout, he attempts to balance a triumphalist tone with tropes of humility. The volume as a whole seems to want to read the victory at Waterloo as a defeat of evil by God that is so profound, so overwhelming in both its glory and its gore that it may be beyond the reach of poetry. I'm arguing that the volume is more tentative than it might appear, that it's concerned with the role of poetry and the poet in celebra celebrating national might, and that it offers in recognizing the distance between God's eternal order and the mess of human history, a balance between rejoicing in victory and mourning the loss necessary to earn that triumph. However, Wordsworth's volume in its central poem were not read that way by his contemporaries. There's something of a media war around Waterloo, Wellington, and Wordsworth in the spring of 1816 between the champion, whose editor John Scott had first celebrated the victory with Hayden, and the examiner, whose editor Lee Hunt had argued with Hayden over the battle. The journals adopted quite different takes on the meaning of Waterloo, with the champion, for example, opening the year calling for everyone, even those on the left, to celebrate Wellington, and the examiner offering, like the Covent Garden pantomime, an orientalist fantasy critical of all the powers that be. And these tensions may have been exacerbated by a rivalry between Scott and Hunt, who both sought to gain the right to publish three sonnets before this volume was published, three sonnets from the Waterloo volume given by Wordsworth to Hayden. Hunt gets all three of them, Scott gets two of them. Then after the day of Thanksgiving, Wordsworth sent three additional sonnets directly to Scott, the two on the Waterloo Monument and the sonnet to Philokaya that I mentioned before. Scott promptly published all of them, only to have Hunt, without permission, reprint them in an article entitled, Heaven Made Party to Earthly Disputes, Mr. Wordsworth's Sonnets on Waterloo. 
Drawing on his earlier piece, Attacking the Holy Alliance, this was the alliance between um, the Allies against Napoleon minus England um, that basically said that they were dedicated to the divine right of kings into a kind of secret alliance to protect the Europe against a future Napoleon and the principles of the French Revolution. So Hunt's already criticized the Holy Alliance. He also criticizes Wordsworth's willingness to support the Allied sovereigns and their ministers and he particularly objects to Wordsworth's appeals to God in his poems to validate his political positions. Hunt understands that Wordsworth's volume, in turning from the battle to its remembrance, wants to argue that, quote, the results of the Battle of Waterloo will be as fine as the thing itself. And he argues that the actual outcome is not a glorious peace, but an unholy alliance of Russia, Prussia, and Austria determined to instill superstitious fear to deprive the people of their authority and to support the notion of divine right. Hunt fears that Wordsworth's poems of thanksgiving get aid and comfort to the Allied rulers in their promulgation of providentially sanctioned oppression. Well, I believe that Wordsworth draws in his Thanksgiving Ode volume on Hunt's own poem on Napoleon's earlier abdication, The Descent of Liberty, which was being read in the Wordsworth household as he prepared his volume. Wordsworth's advertisement indicates he wants to criticize writers such as Hunt who allow, quote, the present distresses under which this kingdom labors to interpose a veil sufficiently thick to hide or even to obscure, obscure the splendor of the great moral triumph at Waterloo. If Wordsworth echoes to refute Hunt, Hunt would offer a counter-intertextual response to Wordsworth's sonnets when he published his own Philokaya poem in the Examiner on March 10th, and then anonymously Byron's On the Star of the Legion of Honor in April, where the French tricolor, revolutionary tricolor, is praised as the rainbow of the free, and when thy bright promise fades away, our life is but a load of clay. Byron was used by Hunt throughout the months after Waterloo to counter nationalist fever from Byron's Farewell to Napoleon, published in July 1815, up until Hunt's farewell when Byron left for Europe, where Hunt praises Byron's scorn of those who trifle with an age freeborn. Byron would then offer his own full response to Wordsworth in Child Herald, Canto the Third. Like Wordsworth, Byron is not interested in Waterloo itself, but its significance how it should be read aesthetically and ideologically. Like Wordsworth, and for that matter, like Dibden in his pantomime, Byron self-consciously calls attention to his role as poet. Byron frames the third canto of Child Herald with autobiography through an address to his daughter. While like Wordsworth, he is asking how history, or nature for that matter, can be converted into poetry, he also gauges more directly the relationship between his life and his work. Much as the poet in Dibden's pantomime becomes Harlequin, Byron the poet becomes Child Harold. Through Harold, he experiences what he would represent. To create and creating live a being more intense that we endow with form our fancy, gaining as we give the life we image. Harold, the wandering outlaw of his own dark mind, is also a wandering avatar of Byron, who has thought too long and darkly. And the very slippage between the speaker and Harold constantly reminds us that we're getting poetry, not some real. Byron seeks to rewrite the Wordsworthian reading of Waterloo where it is seen as a close to and refutation of the revolutionary period. He does this first in his famous lines on Waterloo and Napoleon before Harold and he traveled to various sites dedicated to liberty. Coming to Waterloo, Harold looks for a monument as Wordsworth and others look for a Waterloo monument in London. We are told that this first and last of fields needs no memor memorial beyond itself since the field in returning to its state prior to the battle speaks not to the finality, but the fleetingness of this king making victory. Byron, much like Hunt and others in his circle, rejects the idea that Waterloo as the defeat of Napoleon is also the overthrow of the ideals of the French Revolution behind him. If anything, the battle should be seen not as a combat to make one submit, but a, a struggle to teach all kings true sovereignty. Shall we who struck the lion down, shall we pay the wolf homage? Byron adopts the position of his intellectual allies that the battle was won by the people, by common soldiers, not Wellington. And it is telling that the commander is not even mentioned. This high point of the account of Waterloo then is not a, a celebration of Wellington, but the portrait of Napoleon, described as the greatest nor the worst of men in Byron's own odd litotes. 
antithetically mixed, Napoleon is conqueror and captain of the earth, able to crush, command, rebuild an empire, but unable to govern thy pettiest passion. Napoleon is beset by a fire and emotion of the soul which will not dwell in its own narrow being, but aspire beyond the fitting medium of desire. This makes the madmen who have made men mad by their contagion, conquerors and kings, founders of sects and systems, to whom add sophists, bards, statesmen. Compared to poets and philosophers, Napoleon then is presumably linked to Harold like Byron in his Napoleonic coach, and within the poem to Rousseau, who receives a parallel portrait in the latter half of the poem. The apostle of affliction, Rousseau was a man of great passion, but his love was not the love of living dame, but of ideal beauty. Like Napoleon questing beyond himself, or Byron creating Harold to fulfill his own desires, Rousseau turns from living women to create Julie, and out of this dream of love, a political ideal. Those oracles which set the world in flame, nor ceased to burn till kingdoms were no more, did he not this for France, which lay before, bowed to the inborn tyranny of years, broken and trembling to the yoke she bore, till by voice of him and his calm peers, roused up to too much wrath, which follows overgrown fears. As in this passage, Childhood III, after the section on Waterloo, moves to defend both the Enlightenment that gave rise to revolutionary thought and the fight for, re for freedom across the ages. In addition to Rousseau, we hear of the radical critique of church and state through Voltaire, the Proteus of human talent, whose wit was used now to overthrow a fool and now to shake a throne, and Gibbon, the Lord of Irony, who questioned the religious establishment honing his learning into a weapon with an edge severe, sapping a solemn creed with solemn sneer. If there's no monument at Waterloo for Harold to visit, if no Wellington monument yet stood in London, Harold does visit one to a military hero of the early French Revolution, Marceau, who died in the fourth year of the Republic fighting the Austrians. While Byron decries Waterloo, we hear pra praise of the defense of freedom at Marathon and of Marat, a key Swiss battle for liberty. Byron seeks to revivify belief in revolutionary ideals that conservatives claimed had been finally killed at Waterloo to keep the struggle for freedom alive. Wordsworth had offered a different account, not only in the Thanksgiving Ode volume, but in his excursion of 1814, which used the life of the solitary to track what he sees as this generation's maturation from revolutionary belief to disappointment and despondency, finally to the humility and survival he also preaches in his Thanksgiving Ode. Byron's Child Herald III, which is often seen to engage with Wordsworth's idea of nature, and which opens and closes with allusions to the fourth book of the excursion on despondency corrected, also argues against Wordsworth's politics, to stand not with the holy alliance of rulers, but with a people, a proud brotherly and civic band, all unbought champions, and no princely cause of vice entailed corruption. They no land doomed to bewail the blasphemy of laws, making kings' rights divine. So referring to the same problems that Hunt had with the uh, Holy Alliance. Where Wordsworth saw the message of Waterloo and the revolutionary era as a whole as a despondency over politics and political action altogether, and instead a turn to humility before God, Byron proclaims that none need despair over what he sees as the temporary defeat of revolutionary hopes. But this will not endure, nor be endured. Mankind have felt their strength and made it felt. Where Wordsworth urged his readers after Waterloo to turn from dreams of perfecting social man towards humility before God, Byron urges a renewal of the struggle launched by the intellectual breakthroughs of Voltaire, Gibbon, and Rousseau. Or Wordsworth humbles even himself as he wonders whether his poetry can capture the sublimity of the god of battles. Byron, urging resistance, will go on to proclaim himself in Don Juan, quote, the grand Napoleon of the realms of rhyme. Still, the poem returns to the difficulty of writing a poem on such matters. Before his return to his daughter to close Child Herald III, Byron expresses his belief that there may be words which are things, that one might, as he puts it earlier, find one word, and that word were lightning. Wordsworth also seems to want to transform words into things, or at least his poetry into an inscription engraved in stone for a monument to Waterloo. Beyond writing poems that are speech acts, 
offering a prayer in Wordsworth's poem, proclaiming in Byron's in a famous line, stop for thy tread is on empire's dust. It is almost as if these poets want to escape figurative language itself into objects equal to memorializing the complex thing itself, as Hunt called the battle. If Dibden's pantomime design, if Pid, if Dibden's pantomime deserves to stand with Wordsworth's and Byron's poetic reflections on Waterloo, it is because in that pantomime, with words abandoned, the things themselves, the actual helmets and sabers and standards brought from the battle to the theater, stand eloquently silent on stage, standing both for the victory and the violence of Waterloo. Thank you all.